I'm Dr. Ben Newman. I'm a coronavirus researcher with uh, 25 or so years experience um, working with these viruses. Uh, so today I'm going to answer a question that came in uh, actually about a week ago when it was more relevant. <laughs> uh, and this was um, asking about what's the deal with um, Dr. Robert Malone, who appeared on a thing called the Joe Rogan Show. and I would imagine you've heard about some of this stuff in the news. Uh, um, Joe Rogan's show, if I understand correctly, is exclusive on Spotify or um, there's some sort of contract in place uh, where they pay him a lot of money for that uh, right. And as a result uh, of this sort of stuff, um, which was deemed by many, including me, uh, to be COVID misinformation, they, uh, they decided to... Um, I don't know, a bunch of other artists have left and a bunch of his other podcasts have disappeared, but I don't even know. Yeah, we're not experts in any of that stuff. So yeah, can't really comment on it. Um, so what we can look at, I think, is uh, Dr. Robert Malone and what's going on there. Because yeah, it seems like he ought to know what he's doing. And yet he says some things that kind of make you think, does he really know what he's doing? <laughs> So um, this will be a quick one, but uh, journey with me if you like. Um, so first, let's go to this. Who is Dr. Robert Malone? This is his website. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, when you started off as the original inventor uh, of mRNA and DNA vaccines, wow. And it goes on, and at the bottom it says he is available for speaking engagements. Uh, yeah, ladies, whatever. <laughs> Have him at your kid's birthday party or something, I guess. I believe it will cost you. Um, so, um, in there, I think he's saying some things that make sense and some things that are not particularly based in fact. And then um, when you hear him on shows like this, and this isn't the only thing he's been on at all, um, he says a lot of things that are basically don't, yeah, don't make a lot of sense. So, uh, all right, who is this guy? What's his deal? Um, so he is one of the early pioneers of delivering RNA into cells. And that's good, but he cites himself as the inventor and he does have a patent and so he can literally claim to be an inventor in that limited sense. Um, uh, here's a nice thing. So this is an article uh, just came up in Nature um, uh, and this is uh, actually, yeah, been up for a while in Nature. Um, it's looking at the history of mRNA vaccines and what's inside of them. And that is actually all that's inside of them. Uh, it's various kinds of lipid, uh, some cholesterol molecules, which are these little yellow pills. Um, uh, some of the lipids can be charged up. So they have a positive charge. So they'll stick to the RNA because the backbone of RNA or DNA has these phosphates in it. And they're negative and opposites attract just like the, is it Paula Abdul? I don't know, that old song. Yeah. <laughs> And so that's why the RNA will associate with the little uh, lipid drops. And you can basically stir these things up together or drip one through the other and um, they will form up into little tiny uh, droplets that have some RNA. And it may not just be one piece, there may be several pieces up in there, depending on the size of the thing and the ratio of components. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. Um, so there's nothing nefarious about that and there's no room for a microchip and they don't make microchips that small and honestly that's pretty weird. Um, but I think what this article does very nicely is look at the history of this. So while Dr. Malone was one of the first people to put RNA into cells using actually not this but something vaguely similar to this. Um, he didn't come up with that idea, of course, because nothing is, I don't know, it's very hard to say something is truly your own in science, like an entire concept. Um, you can work on a thing for a lifetime, but there are going to be other people in your field and probably publishing even in your area, and you're not completely independent of the two. If they make a step forward, you've got to go based on that. It's just um, reality. <laughs> anyway. 
Um, yeah, the idea of liposomes, these little fatty blobs, goes way back to the 1960s, like around when mRNA is actually discovered, that far back. <laughs> um, and they were used for vaccine delivery, they were used for uh, DNA delivery, and um, uh, one of his things was um, using them for RNA delivery. And that's great. Yeah, um, that's fine. But it had already been shown that they worked for DNA delivery. And this was one of several technologies for getting DNA into cells. There were different chemicals you could add to your DNA. There were, um, you could pulse your DNA with a little bit of electricity and crash it into cells. You can do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, this is kind of uh, early molecular biology, where you're trying to see what a gene does and so you can modify the gene on a little piece of dna or rna but then to find out what it does you got to get it into a cell and kind of boot it up and see how it works and so yeah he's somewhere in the middle of this process um but early for the rna side of the process but it's only if you take that very narrow <laughs> blinkered view uh that you would say yeah, he's inventing and he's, he's part of a stream and did some important work part of that stream yeah so all right fine um the other thing i would say is that uh the length of time between doing those first steps of work and actually having an rna vaccine that is viable and authorized to treat something is a long time yeah you're talking what 1980 to 2020 ish yeah so 40 years and doing something and then 40 years later having it pay off, that's great. That would feel really good. But unless you were there every step of the way, actually doing all the steps yourself, and nobody does this. Yeah, <laughs> Nobody has that many good ideas in a lifetime. I, yeah, Einstein maybe, I don't even know. <laughs> so it's, it's fine. Yeah, useful person, uh, did some good work. Um, yeah, then you get to the present day. So if we were to, uh, let's see, call up Dr. Malone. And here we go. And if we were to sort these um, by date, what we end up with is kind of a mess. Um, let's see, custom range, 1980 to 2022 and this guy there we go um and so let's sort these by year there that's a better way to do it eh, all right googling yeah <laughs> it can be done um so uh yeah so we got some papers coming up in 2021 and 2020 most of these though when you look at them are like guides for preparation and a lot of them are kind of opinion based. He was involved in a couple of things that didn't work out. So big um, proponent of trying famotidine, which is one of these uh, antihistamines uh, is used to treat um, ulcers. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it didn't work. It was based on, frankly, uh, kind of not very good data that I think we pointed out at the time. Um, uh, and yeah, it turned out uh, not to be a thing. Uh, and has since gone on to be a big proponent of um, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. So he's high on all the things that people that are not going with mainstream science are really jazzed about, I would say. And so I can see why people like this. But essentially, this is a string of failures i don't know it's, it's basically yeah trying a thing and having it not turn out to be the answer but then not changing and going in a different direction but popping the blinkers on and only looking at data that confirms the hypothesis your hypothesis already that you have and yeah it ends up being just a mess Go back in time, though, and you see that there's a little flurry of activity here around 2016, 2017, uh, involving Zika. There was a little tiny bit. Um, I think this was around uh, the time of uh, Ebola. 
and before that he was basically out of science uh, since 2007 now he was doing other things uh, he was part of a company and doing stuff but is no longer doing bench research now if you go back before this like before 2005 i think he's got uh, fairly regular uh, publications uh, going back there um yeah and so uh, th that would be uh, indication of uh, sort of active work um so this is somebody that was instrumental a long time ago did a bunch of work kind of stopped doing that work for a while shifted over to a different sort of role uh, and he talks uh in the joe rogan podcast about uh, being on a lot of study sections which is good and being connected to a lot of people um which is fine but irrelevant <laughs> all of this is fine but irrelevant it shows that you're like an insider in the sense that you're talking to important people and you're maybe one of them but it's not the same thing as expertise and here's our point yeah I've said this before i think uh um actually if you look at the transcript uh which uh, uh texas congressman helpfully uh, uh loaded into the congressional record uh and also posted on his site i think he gives more detail when he's talking about his horses than he does <laughs> with anything to do with the science he may or may not know things that are up to date about mrna vaccines but from the stuff he says in the interview it essentially lacks detail it's what i would expect from somebody with strong opinions but who maybe hasn't read many papers in the last two years and yeah that's the thing with expertise expertise is not a thing that you ever have and can hold on to it's a thing you can get out there and earn every single day by digging through journals and you're not going to build expertise solely through your own work in fact you'll build a lot more and better expertise you probably won't build any expertise if you only look at your own work you'll build more and better expertise by looking at the work that everybody else is doing and bringing that into your worldview. Um, and you can't say what's going on in the person's mind, but I don't see anything in this very long interview. <laughs> he mentions a lot of stuff. Uh, he name checks Wuhan a couple of times in there and ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and there's never it doesn't look like he's ever accounting for much of the data or all of the data it looks as though at most it's like he's getting information from or you could i don't know what i don't know what he's read and hasn't read but you could give this interview if you had only seen facebook for the past year and never read a science paper I think you could come to exactly the same statements and I think it would be a reasonable position. So yeah, that's how you can start out as the world's leading expert in something like RNA vaccination. And I think there's a reasonable case that there was a time and he was the world's leading expert. And you can end up 40-ish years later after doing a bunch of other stuff and whatever, having a cool life probably, I don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, and basically not have expertise because expertise is fleeting. It is very short lived you never really have it. All you can do is keep running after it. It's a thing you got to chase, not a thing you can ever hold. So yeah, I think this is more an exercise in, uh, hubris than anything else, but there you go. <laughs> So that's uh, as far as I can go. Um, the only other uh, comment on this is that I know uh, Joe Rogan has come out and said that he's going to do a better job at looking and making sure that he's only giving sensible scientific information. I don't know that Joe Rogan has the scientific background to accurately assess that. And so I it feels like the sort of thing you'd say. That's Darwin over there. It feels like the sort of thing you'd say if you wanted people to maybe give you back your money and your show. But it's like a thing you can say more than a thing you can do i think yeah so 
whatever that is what it is <laughs> so uh anyway yeah uh yeah if you like those podcasts i don't know yeah good for you yeah i'm probably not gonna um spend a lot of time on them um yeah thanks very much this has been ask dr ben <laughs>